How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Uh, so thankful that you're here today. We're continuing back into our series in 1 Corinthians. And so if you have your Bible, I just want to encourage you to turn there with me and with us. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting verse 17. Um, I know it's been a few weeks, but we're going to continue to study this book together and see how the Lord will speak to us in and through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. I believe the verses will be on the screen. And so uh, if you would like to, you can follow along there. Going to verse 24. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who, has, who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become a bondservant of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let... Sorry. sorry. There, let him remain with God. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this place and to worship you. I thank you for the songs that have been sung and the gifts that have been given, prayers that have been lifted up, Father, hearts that have been opened to hear a word from you. Father, I pray that you would just continue to guide us into a time of worship now as we come to your word. I pray that, that we would allow ourselves to hear a message from you. Father, I recognize that I have a part in this, and so if you would, Lord, forgive me of my sin, cleanse me of the unrighteousness that is in my life, and give me the grace that is needed to preach your word in a way that brings honor and glory to your name, in a way that brings sinners to repentance and believers into a time of renewal in their relationship to you. Father, we know that you are at work all around us. And so, Father, I trust that you are working here today. And so, Father, speak to us. Pierce our heart, sanctify our thinking, correct our desires. And, Father, give us the grace that is needed to respond to your will, to your call on our life. And, Father, I pray there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I pray that today will be the day of, that, of their salvation, the day where they admit that they are a sinner, believe that Jesus is a son of God and confess Christ as Savior and Lord. And for the believer that's here that may be struggling or going through hardships or difficulties or spiritual famine, Father, I pray that you would just give them the grace that they need to have their cup filled. Father, I pray that you would encourage them, that you would remind them of your love, of your kindness, of your mercy, of your grace, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you and pray all these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Well, it's good to see you. Good to be back here in 1 Corinthians. Uh, our theme for the day is that God meets us where we are at life, in our life. Um, when I was younger, I used to do a little bit of camping, hiking, and I, uh, I quickly realized that once I got into doing this, one, it's a kind of expensive hobby, and two, that uh, there's a lot of stuff that you think that you need to take with you that you really don't need, you know. And once you are six miles into a hike, you think, you know what, I don't need all this stuff that's in my backpack, you know. And, uh, and the, the more you do it, the, the more you realize you can get away with a lot less junk than you thought you needed. When I was finishing up my college career, I, I spent eight weeks in South East Alaska serving different churches and each week me and three other seven missionaries we would travel from one church to another. Each week we would 
pack up our bags and we would hop on a, a boat and we would go from one church to the next. In southeast Alaska, you don't go from car to car to from town to town. It's, it's all islands or it's land. I mean, it's like waterlocked. And there's this, there's only one way to get from one point to another. It's either by boat or plane. And we took boat every town that we went to. And uh, we had some difficulties, some hardships along the way. And sometimes, you know, you, you think you need more stuff than you really do. And there were two boys and two girls. And I'm not going to tell you which of the sex thought they needed more stuff than the other. But I packed a backpack and everything that I needed went into that backpack for the entire eight weeks that I was there. And there were a couple of other people that thought they needed two humongous suitcases full of clothes and everything else. And they tried to lug those suitcases around from boat to boat, from church to church. And they thought that these two young men were going to help them everywhere. <laughs> My father-in-law has a saying, and I wish I would have heard it back then, but if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're just... They learned, though, friends. They learned a valuable lesson that summer that in order for God to use you, you don't need as much as you think that you need. Sometimes we think that in order to be used by God, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to pack this. I need to check this box. There are times when I think we, we add to the gospel in order for God to love us, in order for us to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to do this. We need to do that. We make it harder than it really needs to be. In today's passage of Scripture, Paul is teaching the church in Corinth that God calls us to where we are, who we are. Three times, friends, in this passage of Scripture, Paul repeats this principle. We see the first time in verse 17, the second time in verse 20, and the third time at the end in verse 24. Let's start by looking at this first time, verse 17. Only... Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all of the churches. The only here in the beginning of this verse is very important as we understand this passage of Scripture. It, the NIV translates it, however, the King James or New King James has but. Some, some people even say it, it's really if not. Uh, the emi here in Greek is if not, but you know, only is in the NASB and, and then the ESV, which is what I use. And so uh, I think it's, the point is, is that it connects us to this passage to where we were three weeks ago. Y'all remember three weeks ago, right? It wasn't Easter Sunday. It wasn't Palm Sunday. It wasn't when Pastor Ken preached in view of a call. It was me preaching the first 16 verses of this passage of Scripture. I'm sure you remember. It was such a good sermon. <laughs> Roger, I know you don't forget anything that I say, you know. And so, but it was, it was Paul saying, hey, if you're, if you're married, stay married. If you're divorced, stay divorced. If you're widowed, stay widowed. If you, but if you burn with lust and desire, then guess what? Get married. That's what, remember that passage of Scripture? Remember what he, I'm sure you remember. It's all coming back to you now. So Paul says, but, however, only, whatever state we are in, when God calls us to salvation, we are not to be in a hurry to change it. My, my seminary professor, Dr. David Garland, he explains in his commentary in 1 Corinthians that having accepted God's call, Christians must accept that God accepts them as they are. Their conversion requires a change in lordships, in spiritual values, in moral behavior, but not in change of race, gender, or social set caste. God doesn't love the Africans more than the Europeans. He doesn't love the Americans more than the Asians. Friend, God doesn't love you more because you're a Baptist. He loves the Methodists just as much, but... I mean, the Baptists know how to read the Bible. You know, that's the only difference between the Methodists and the Bible. I, wouldn't it be a mess, though? I mean, if like in order for us to be saved, like in order for God to love us, we had to jump through this hoop, and then we had to jump through that hoop, 
And then we had to, we had to go do this and we had, to, we had to look like this and we had to look like this person and, and, and do it this way. And I mean, wouldn't that just be exhausting? I mean, sometimes I, I look at churches and I think, man, like, in order to go there, you have to look this way, look that way, read from this Bible. I mean, it's like, I don't know about that. I, I think it kind of can be misleading. Do you know what God tells us to do after we become a believer? Go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, nothing. The Holy Spirit will take care of the rest, friends. I'm not sure about you, but I, I mean, when I mess up, the Holy Spirit lets me know. When I sin, when I make a mistake, I mean, God will let me know what it is. And if God doesn't do it, and if I don't listen to God, my wife will tell me what I did wrong, okay? Like, I'm telling you, like, I just, and it's just one of those things where like, you we, sometimes we just, we make it, we add to the suitcase. We make it harder than it really is. And in order for us to, be, you got to put this in your bag. And then you got to make it, make it look this way. You got to have this color. I mean, it's like, Paul is saying, hey, listen here, friends. God called you knowing who you were. I mean, he knew everything about you and he still loved you. He still said, you know what, I, I love you. I know who you are. I know where you're from. I know how much money's in your bank account. I know what color skin you got. I know what you believe. I know what you think. I know where your heart's at. I know what church you go to. I know what neighborhood you live in. I know what school, I mean, I, I've seen it all. I love you. Verse 18 and 19 are examples, modern examples for Paul, not really for us, to try to teach the church what he's talking about. Verse 18, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Paul says whether you are circumcised or not is not important. Who was circumcised? The Jews. And the Gentiles, of course, were not. So Paul is saying here, the Jews don't need to stop being Jews. And the Gentiles, they don't need to stop being a Gentile. But I think sometimes when we get our priorities a little bit messed up, and Jews can be Christians, and Christians don't need to convert to Judaism in order to be a follower of Jesus. Your culture, your heritage doesn't need to change just because your faith in God has changed. God knows your history. He knows when you are called. Here's the kicker of it all, friends. In spite of it all, in spite of who you are, God wants to use you for the kingdom. He wants to use you to reach people like you God wants to use you to reach people like you. Hmm. When I was a youth minister down in Texas, I, uh, I was in over my head, uh, to say the least. And uh, I... Uh, I remember having a conversation with a young girl one time at the end of our youth uh, night. It's Wednesday night. And she came to me and she was, having she was having just questions about her life and her identity. And so we sat out in the parking lot and we talked. And, uh, and man, I just, we had a really good conversation. And I thought to myself, at the end of that conversation, I just wanted to pat myself on the back. I almost, you know, just hurt myself doing it, you know. And, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me that night. I was like six months into this job. And said, you know what, like, that, you really did have a great conversation, Jeff. And good job and 
all of that. But you know what? There's 39 other kids that were there that night that didn't get to have a conversation with you. Like they didn't get to have that great conversation. And like you can only do so much. You know, as a, as a, as a person, there's only so much that you can do. And like I, I recognize as a, as like a pastor, there are some people that look at me and I'm, I'm tall and I'm ugly and I'm bald and I'm got a deep voice. I got hair in my face and, and like, it's a, like I can be an intimidating figure and I, I hate that. But like some people are like, I don't know if I trust this guy. I don't know if I feel comfortable talking to him and maybe I'll go talk to, to her. She seems a lot more approachable or much more somebody that I can relate to. One of the things I love about our staff, friends, is that like, there are people that are from south of the Mason-Dixon and north of the Mason-Dixon. There are some of us that are white, some of us are black, some of us are old, some of us are young, some of us are male, some of us are female. Like, we're not all the same. You know, we're not all 40-year-old white guys, you know? I love that about our staff, that we're different. And we, we, we come from different backgrounds, different social settings, different situations. We've had different life experiences, different hardships, different challenges. And God has called us at different times in our lives as well. And allows for each of us to be able to serve people who are like us. And I, I, I can't be all things to all people, friends. I'm not going to be. God knows this about each of us. And knows like, hey, if, if, if Roger would just accept this call, man, man, what a great guy he would be for the kingdom. If Seth would say yes, I mean, and I'll, I'll, man, what a wonderful thing that would be. If Sarah would do, the, I mean, like, wow, we could just, just think about the people she could reach. Does that make sense? God knows about your past. He knows your story. You don't need to change your story. You don't need to change who you are. There are some things about your life that might need to go. But your identity... There are people in the church in Corinth who were getting circumcised or hiding their circumcision because they thought it would elevate them spiritually in the eyes of others and in the eyes of God. Paul says, hey, listen, do the right thing for the right reason. God is, God is much more impressed with you doing the right thing for the right reason than doing the right thing for the wrong. There's a difference, right? I mean, you doing the right thing for the wrong reason isn't the same as you doing the right thing for the right reason. God is impressed with your heart. God is impressed with your faith. God is impressed by your faithfulness to him. Your acts, friends, I mean, God can, God can see right through the shadiness of your deeds. Again, for the second time, Paul tells us in verse 20 to remain in the condition that you are in. Each one of you should remain in the condition that you was called. Again, the calling can, refers to one's salvation here. In the last few verses, Paul was referring to racial and, and cultural situations, Jew, Gentile. But in the next few verses, he's referring to social status. Verse 21, when you are a bondservant, were you a bondservant when you were called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. Verse 22, for he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. A bondservant was a slave. Now, it wasn't the type of slave that we think of in our own American history. But a bondservant, there was all kinds of different bondservants. But a bondservant was someone who was able to earn their freedom. They were able to buy themselves as a... Uh, as a, by themselves out of slavery into a free person. Uh, if a, a, 
If they did, though, if they bought their freedom, their master used that money to go and, and afford themselves the opportunity to buy another servant. So they couldn't just, like, dismiss them. Like, if you were a master, you couldn't just, like, dismiss them. It wasn't financially advantageous for you to be able to do this, right? For most. But a servant wasn't... Uh, A servant was a person that was trusted. A master chose a servant because they could trust them. They could not worry about them stealing their possessions or hurting their family or their wife or children. How oftentimes a servant would care for their children, care for their family. Oftentimes a servant would pick their son's, a master's son's wife. Sometimes a female servant would become a concubine and, and have children of the master. And a lot of times a, a, a person that was poor was in, in dire situations. They would sell themselves into this slavery to allow themselves an opportunity to have a better life. They had no other option. They had no better opportunity. And so they thought, if I, was, if I could be a servant in that home and in that situation, man, what a great thing that would be for me. Like, I would, I would much rather be in that situation than in the situation that I'm in now. And the, the temptation was for, the, for the, the church in Corinth, for the Christians that were at the lower status, they saw other Christians at a higher status, and they would say, I, in order for God to love me, I, I got to be what? Like them. In order for God to use me, I, I need to... And so they, what did they do is they would sell themselves into what? slavery for no other reason because they thought that maybe by changing their social status they might be loved more by God that God might be able to use them in more profound ways <laughs> a bond servant could buy land eventually from their servant they could marry even into the family and so the temptation was there. It was a real temptation, friends. And Paul is saying to these Christians in Corinth, hey, you don't need to, like, listen, you were bought. Listen to what he says in, in verse 23. You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Like, you are, you are free men of Christ. And he says to the, to the masters, hey, listen, just because you're free doesn't mean that you're not a, what? A servant of Christ. Does this make sense? Paul is saying to them, listen, allow for yourself to be who God wants you to be. When God calls you into salvation, don't rush off and change who you are just quite yet. Allow for the doors to be open for God to use you just as you are. Does this make sense? I had a conversation with a young man this week and uh, he told me, he goes, Pastor Jeff, he goes, I was, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. You know, I told him, I said, listen, I, I had plastic wear, you know, <laughs> and, and like we, we washed it when we were done with it. You know what I mean? Like we didn't throw it away. We used it again. I mean, that's, that's, that's the type of house that, hold that I was born into you know and, and friends let me tell you something like I I have no idea what that life's like you know like I just uh, I oftentimes I think we don't allow ourselves those opportunities to go through hardships you know I, I listen to different pastors and they talk about how hard and difficult pastoral ministry is and I'm like man this is the easiest job I've ever had in my entire life you know and I don't say that lightly I mean like I, every job that I've had this is the easiest one you know and I, I, I love what I do I, I, I don't dread coming to work every day I, I don't uh, like some people I mean they I, this is I, it's fun it's life giving friends. It truly it is. And I, I tell people all the time, this is, 
the most meaningful, most important job I'll ever have is being the pastor of White Park Baptist Church. I don't dread it. I don't, you know, I could be here every day of the week and I love being here. Truly, I do. And uh, this week I was talking to a 73-year-old pastor and uh, I just met the guy, friend of a friend. And, uh, and I just thought to myself, like, man, I hope when I'm 73 years old, I'm still preaching the gospel, you know. And I, when God, when I, my first pastor was a small church. I told you this before. And, uh, and this 73-year-old pastor was pastor in a small church in, in Iowa. And I just thought, man, like, I hope when I'm 73, that's what I'm still doing, you know. I. I don't know if I want to be here when I'm 73, you know. I hope I'm, I'm here for a long time. But I, at the same time, I hope, you know, that at 73, I'm still proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. George Whitfield says, I'd rather rust out than, I'd rather wear out than, or burn out than rust out. And I just think, man, that's just that's a great line, you know. I'd rather burn out than rust out. And God has called us, friends, to service, to be used. He hasn't called us to sit around and do nothing. And I, I don't know your story. I know some of your stories. But as I look around the room, I don't know all of your stories. And I, God does, though. God knows each and every one of you. He knows you by name. He knows every decision that you've made, every situation that you've been in. He knows what your deepest, darkest secrets are, your hardships, your struggles. And in spite of it all, friends, he loves you. And he, there's a place for you in the kingdom of God. There's a place, an opportunity for you to use your story for the glory of God. Do not get weary, friends, of doing good. <laughs> Do not grow weary of serving him. It's the greatest calling that you can have is to serve the Lord. And he's called you to salvation to be like him and to serve him. I hope that you can find a way in your life, that you can find an opportunity in your life to be used for the glory of God. The greatest joy you ever have, friends, is knowing that you're inside of the will of God. Amen. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to be gathered together in this place. Father, I know that you are speaking to us, and even through a, a man like myself. Father, I, I just I pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, Take our story, take our life, and give us the grace that we need to be used by you, for you. Father, I, uh, I ask that you would speak to us now as we come into a time of decision, Father, I pray that you would help us to be obedient, to be faithful to your will. As we hear your call, Lord, would you give us the grace that we need to respond, to say yes. Father, I, I, uh, I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life. I'm so grateful for this church for the opportunity to serve here. And I pray that, Lord, that, that you are calling men and women out of this church to reach the nations. I pray, Lord, that this isn't a, a church that just gathers together on Sunday morning and socializes and drinks coffee but father rather is a church that leaves this place ready and willing 
to reach the nations. Yes. And so, Father, as you call us and you use services like today, Father, speak to us and penetrate our hearts and allow for us to hear from you the call to go and serve, to go and be faithful. Lord Jesus, we love you and pray all these things in your name. Amen. Friends, this is an opportunity for you to respond as the Lord leads. This altar is here for you. If you want to come forward and pray, you can. I'm going to be back in the Welcome Center, and I would love to be able to pray with you, pray for you. Whatever it is you may, go, may be going through, I would love to be able to, just to be able to be with you in this time. Father, uh, friends, I, I just want to let you know that if, if you've never met. Yes. Friends, I just want to thank you so much for being here today, and I want to invite you back for our Wednesday night services. We have different Bible studies, a meal from 5 to 6, and um, I just want to invite you, if you ever need anything, to come by the office. We're open Monday through Thursday from 7.30 to 4.30, closed from 12 to 1, and just love to be able to, to talk to you if you need anything. I'm always available. Uh, doors are always open, and so we're, uh, we're excited about what's happening here at White Park. Excited that you have come and, and decided to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you're a guest here today, we'd love to be able to shake your hand and get to know you and get you a cup of coffee in our, our coffee bar. Uh, any other announcements or anything that we need to say before we are dismissed? All right, well, let's close with our benediction and prayer. Would you pray with me? Loving Lord and Heavenly Father, I offer up today all that I am and all that I have and all that I do, and all that I suffer, to be yours today and yours forever. Give me grace, Lord, to do all that I know of your holy will, purify my heart, sanctify my thinking, correct my desires. Teach me in all of today's work and trouble and joy to respond with honest praise, simple trust, and instant obedience, that my life may be a living sacrifice by the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, my Master and my all. Amen. Go in peace.